morning, everyone. Thanks so much for joining us today. Um, very important, very topical um, breakfast briefing for you this morning. How can we build back better from COVID-19? And thanks so much to Dr. Deborah Han and all of the people that are going to be speaking this morning um, for sharing their thoughts and ideas about how we can really start to rebuild ourselves after this um, crisis. So I'm Sarah Lethbridge. I'm the Director of Ex Executive Education and External Relations here at Cardiff Business School. Um, my email, telephone number, telephone still works um, through Skype. Um, so yeah, please do contact me if you've got any queries about any of our short courses. Um, speech to text captioning is now available for this event. Um, I think one of the team is going to post the link again in case you've only just joined. Um, so yeah, we're really trying to make these sessions as accessible as possible. So um, please do click the link and that should then open up in a new window. And then I think you have to do a bit of manoeuvring to make sure you can see the webinar and the text captioning. But hopefully you'll be able to manage that and um, yeah, it'll make sure that you can see everything that everyone's saying. So thanks for that. Um, in terms of our next breakfast briefings, we may squeeze another one in before November, but we might not. So watch this space. Um, Thursday, the 19th of November, um, we've got someone from our economy, uh, economic section talking about actually the global economy after COVID-19. And Tuesday, the 15th of December, um, Professor Jonathan Morris is going to be talking about the future of white collar work. So please do um, look out for those sessions and sign up. That'd be great. Um, yeah, we've still accepting places on our Masters of Public Leadership programme. The programme director is Dr Catherine Farrell. Um, so if you're interested in the Masters of Public Leadership, a fantastic programme, do get in touch. And we've, you know, we've become really quite good now at delivering our programmes online. So if your organisation does have any needs to develop bespoke offerings, or you're interested in some of our open programmes like our Lean Six Sigma course, then do get in touch. And this webinar is being recorded. You should have a Q&A button um, either at the bottom of the screen or at the top. So please do put through your questions as all of our speakers are going to be talking to you. And then um, at the end, we'll select some of those. We may even enable your mic. So be prepared for that to happen. And you can ask the um, question yourself, depending on technical um, issues, of course. So um, I think that's it from me. And now great pleasure to hand over to Debs. Thanks, Debs. Thanks, Sarah. Good morning and welcome to this breakfast briefing, looking at how employers might be able to build back better. When we first started talking about this breakfast briefing back in April, we were really concerned that by the time this session came around, we might be so far out the other side of the crisis that the notion of building back better would be irrelevant. But given where we are, that clearly isn't the case and never has there been a more relevant time to open the discussion about how we might begin to reshape our society once we're out of the current new normal and into the next new normal. The current pandemic has had significant dis disproportionate impact on particular groups in our society. The headlines tell us every day that particular groups uh, are, are suffering, that the BME and those from low, low socioeconomic backgrounds are faring worse in this current crisis. Over the past few months, a number of my colleagues have done fantastic jobs with these breakfast briefings in highlighting research evidence that shows that this impact, that the impact of the COVID crisis it has been disproportionate within our communities. Although life is hard for many at the moment, there are also many examples of organizations trying hard to do the right things by their employees. James Timson from Timson spoke passionately on a previous, bre previous breakfast briefing about how he was supporting his employees through the crisis by topping up furlough payments to the tune of half a million pound a week and checking in on those colleagues without any other support networks. Morrison Supermarkets, who amongst other things have launched a hardship fund for staff facing financial challenges as a result of the outbreak. They've also guaranteed pay for any member of staff who's off sick or has otherwise been affected by COVID and have looked at making shift patterns and holidays more flexible. We hope with this breakfast briefing to get people thinking about what difference they could make, both whilst we ride out the rest of the immediate pandemic, but also in how we rebuild our society afterwards. The intention with this breakfast briefing is to argue that it's not sufficient to simply go back to the way things were, but there's a need to really examine ways organizations can be leaders in change for good. 
The genesis for this breakfast briefing began with a conversation over Zoom about a great piece that had been written by Thomas Piketty, who's an economist, for The Guardian back in May. Uh, I'll pop the link in a second to the article in the chat function. Piketty, for those of you who don't know, is an economist who for the last 10 years has been arguing that the current system of capitalism doesn't work because the system simply reinforces and exacerbates inequalities. In May, Piketty wrote an article entitled, Will COVID Lead to Fairer Societies? It talked about the fact that the Black Death led to widespread deaths amongst those from lower socioeconomic backgrounds and the loss of so many lives amongst the manual laborers, laborers led to people recognizing the value of this group to society. He summarized by saying powerful shocks like pandemics, wars or financial crashes have an impact on our society. But the nature of that impact depends on the theories people hold about history, society and the balance of power. It always takes major social and political mobilization to move societies forward in the direction of equality. And it was this quote that was the genesis for today's session. The idea of building back better is taken from OECD policy that clearly identifies that business as usual just won't work as we move out of the COVID crisis. And the recovery policies also need to trigger behavioral changes that will increase society's resilience. We hope this morning to start the conversation about those new, what those new approaches might look like. We're focusing on employment suggestions because that's where our expertise lies and because these policies can have very immediate impact for individuals. But we should be very clear that these are not the only options that will help our societies build back better. They're rather one tool in a bigger box. This morning's briefing will be in three parts. Each will look at a different positive action or commitment to employees that an organization could take and the community that employers are undertaking. We'll explore the nature and purpose of the scheme and hear from employers and in some cases employees as to the impact of these schemes and why they feel these schemes are even more important in the COVID era. We'll also provide details of who to contact if you think you might want to sign up or you want help convincing your employer to sign up. The three schemes we'll feature are the Real Living Wage, the Community Jobs Compact, and the Payroll uh, Lending Scheme. So I want to hand over now to Sarah Hopkins from Cunnel Cymru, who'll help explain the Real Living Wage and identify how we might build back better. Thanks, Debs. Um, I'm Sarah Borodar. Good morning, everybody. Um, I'm the Director of Cunnel Cymru, Sustain Wales. So at Cunnel, we work to accelerate sustainable development in Wales, but one of our most important roles is as the Real Living Wage Accreditation Body. In this role, we guide organisations based in Wales through the process of living wage accreditation from when they first express interest. So what is the Real Living Wage? It's a wage that enables employees to meet everyday needs. It is independently calculated by the Resolution Foundation and voluntarily paid by organisations. The real living wage is based on actual living costs, and this makes it distinct from the national living wage, the former minimum wage, introduced by the government in 2016. The campaign for the real living wage was started by Citizens UK, the home of community organising in 2001. It now has the support of over 6,000 businesses across the UK, including 253 in Wales and 117 of these in Cardiff. Employers from any sector or any industry can become accredited. Recently, we've accredited organisations including private care providers, Tempo Time Credits, Sparkles Cleaning, who we'll hear from a little bit later, Bangor University and Cardiff and Vale University Health Board. So to become accredited, employers must commit to paying all their directly employed staff a real living wage and have a plan in place to extend that to regular subcontracted staff. These subcontracted staff typically include cleaning, catering and security staff, those who work regularly on the premises. The rate of the real living wage is increased each November during Living Wage Week, and this year Living Wage Week will start on the 9th of November. Since 2011, over £32 million in extra wages have gone into employees' pockets in Wales, directly benefiting over 7,000 Welsh workers. Now, local authorities can and do play a really important part in promoting the living wage in their area. In November last year, Cardiff became only the second UK city to have living wage city status. This achievement was the result of strong partnership working between the public, private and voluntary sectors in Cardiff, 
including key local organisations such as Cardiff University, Capital Law, Cardiff Third Sector Council and Admiral Insurance. Now, to, to support uh, the take up of living wage accreditation within Cardiff, Cardiff Council has established a living wage accreditation support scheme, which pays Cardiff based SMEs accreditation fees for three years. So if you're interested in this, I can pop some more in um, the link in the chat. However, despite all this really good progress, in-work poverty remains a growing issue in Cardiff. Currently one in five jobs in Cardiff, that's around 42,000 jobs, pay below the real living wage. So how can the real living wage help us build that better? We know that COVID has hit the lowest paid workers the hardest. Issues of class and status, prejudice and discrimination are strengthened by larger income differences. To build a resilient and healthy society of the future, we need to reduce this gap in income inequality. Secondly, Welsh Government has recognised the concept of fair work can help achieve a stronger, modernised and more inclusive economy. Fair reward, with the real living wages and minimum, is a key component of the definition of fair work put forward by the Fair Work Commission in 2019. And finally, payment of the real living wage is an enabler. It provides other co-benefits to society and ensures inclusive economic recovery. There's substantial evidence that people on lower pay spend more as a proportion of their income than high earners. So any boost to income will lead to a boost in local spending. We know from speaking to employees that have received the real living wage, that earning the living wage allows them to live and not just survive. It gives people the opportunity to save a little and to have some discretionary income. But I think it's, it would be great this morning to hear a bit more from some of the employers. So to hear what it means for employers, it's my pleasure to welcome Katie Roderick from Burns Pet Food. Katie. Thanks very much. Hello there, good morning, Burida Pawb. Um, Sarah, thank you ever so much for that wonderful introduction um, to the living wage um, and you know the key concepts of that. Um, here in Burns Pet Nutrition, um, for which I'm the HR manager, we believe that paying a living wage is actually a key building block um, to building resilience within our local community here in West Wales. Um, and it's also an absolutely fundamental part um, of our economic recovery. Um, so we were actually accredited in 2014 um, and it's something that John Burns, our owner, has fundamentally believed in since he started the company in 1993. Uh, he's always been extremely passionate about uh, paying a fair day's wage for a fair day's work. Um, we were delighted to be the first pet food company um, in the whole of the UK to become an accredited employer. Um, and we do aim to continue to be a catalyst for change um, and encourage other businesses to follow suit as well. Um, so moving on to, you know, what are the benefits of um, the living wage? So why, if you, you know, anybody becomes, you know, a company owner or um, starts a new venture, why would you consider paying your employees um, a living wage? Now, the benefits for us are threefold. They're good for the individual employees. They're great for us as a business um, and society as a whole. So paying the living wage um, encourages good employee relations. And we've seen actively um, a massive impact on the bottom line. Um, we have increased retention, so we keep our talented, hardworking staff. Um, the living wage encourages our staff to be fully engaged and productive. Um, and it also has led to reduced absenteeism and increased well-being as well. Um, the living wage has um, you know, contributed to our excellent reputation as an employer of choice. Um, and it helps us to compete. You know, you have to, as a company, think about what your USP is. Um, and one of our words, indeed, is treating our staff, um, you know, with absolute respect. And in fact, when I conduct interviews for any roles within the company, um, it's that age old interview question. What can you tell us about the company? Um, and everybody seems to mention, oh, I know you're an accredited living wage employer. I think that's great. That fits with you know, a lot of people's ethical orientation. Um, and that leads us to attracting talent locally. We have a you know, pick of the bunch from CVs. Everybody wants to work for us. Um, and you know, even to the point where we, we actually pay our apprentices the living wage as well. I mean, you know, the apprentice wage is you know, pitifully low. Um, and you know, apprentices are extremely hard working. Um, so we like to recognize that by also paying them the living wage. Um, 
and indeed for employees, and I do have a statement from one of our employees just to sort of um, highlight what it actually means for them. Um, it leads to improved work-life balance. Um, and, you know, it's great that they actually have a guaranteed annual pay increase, which is linked to the cost of living. I mean, the cost of living, you know, increases year on year. And if salaries remain static, um, then that's just not going to be good for societies, uh, for families. And um, indeed, you know, Burns, as part of being a living wage employer, we do stand firm against the zero hours culture um, that you know is sort of present um, in the UK. We like to provide quality and meaningful work for the communities that we operate in. Um, you know, the living wage, on a lighter note, does provide companies with an opportunity to have fun um, and actually celebrate the living wage and you know what we're trying to do. So every year, you know, living wage week, everybody looks forward to the cakes that we have with the living wage badge on. Um, you know, we celebrate the customers in our stores joining the celebrations too. Um, so it really is just a, a nice bonding experience for the whole company, really. Um, so I'll just read a short statement from one of our employees. Um, so this is from Tia, and Tia works in um, our farm shop, which is based in Kidwelly. So she just mentions, what I love about the living wage is it makes me feel appreciated by my employer. I'm not just working to live as I did in previous jobs. I've had two jobs to get by recently uh, with very little time for myself to enjoy hobbies and take care of pets. But since working for Burns, I feel that they respect me and, they, um, and in return, I give so much back. I feel so much happier working for Burns as I have time for myself again and I'm able to enjoy going out and have holidays without doing lots of overtime to be able to save to do these things. So you can see there we have a lot, you know, a lot of families who, um, you know, previously worked two jobs um, and even so they were still sort of working yet in poverty. And now they have a lot more disposable income to go and, you know, spend time with their children, go on holidays, um, you know, treat their pets. And um... Katie's might be having some technical issues okay so if, if we if katie comes back we can we can go back and uh, let her finish off that statement but um oh hi katie oh hi <laughs> yeah, lost you for a sec oh sorry i thought it was cut off because i was speaking for too long <laughs> <laughs> i think that um i mean in in um you know just, just to summarize you know we're, we're really passionate and um, sarah you mentioned the wonderful work that's um you know happening in cardiff and that's absolutely key and you know we want to absolutely um you know continue the work in uh, rural communities as well especially west wales we're spreading that message and um, yes, onwards and upwards for the living wage. OK, great. Well, thank you so much, Katie. And um, yeah, I uh, thank you for all the, the brilliant work that you're no doing. No problem. Yeah. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. Yeah. Uh, we're going to now move on to Simon Pickthall from Sparkles Cleaning uh, Services to talk to us about his recent accreditation. Simon. Hi, good morning everyone. Lovely Hi. to meet you. Thanks, Sarah. Hello. I would have thought by now I'd learned to switch the mic on and off after nine months of this. <laughs> I apologize if there's any background noise. I've got a very excited puppy in the house. So um, if there's any screaming, it's the puppy and I'm not doing anything horrible to a child, I promise. I might have to speak to Katie <laughs> later about the landmines the puppy keeps. Yes, yeah, please do. So, yeah, absolutely. <laughs> appreciate that. <laughs> Um, yeah, lovely to be here. Um, as I said, we're, we're recently accredited, but we have um, we've previously paid above the real living wage. Uh, in any event, um, I think what's interesting for SMEs and speaking to other business owners is they're very worried about costs. Generally, it's sort of built into the DNA of a small business holder. Um, so owners, so it's very difficult for people to conceive of a higher wage cost. So um, I think one of the things we might want to think about as a group is how we might reduce that anxiety and some of the things Katie talked about, the benefits I think would really, really help. Um, we, uh, as an organization, have a sort of relentless focus on what matters to customers, but also we spend a lot of time alongside our cleaners. Um, and the question we ask is, you know, what could be easier for you? What gets in the way and all that sort of stuff. Um, so we clear problems for them. And what that's enabled us to do is have quite low management costs because the cleaners tend to uh, crack on, uh, get things done themselves, uh, solving problems. So as a result, um, 
we've got low management costs, which also helps then with in terms of salaries. So what we've managed to do over the last two years is increase uh, turnover by 400% by that relentless focus, uh, that's pre-COVID. And obviously, as you can imagine, we're cleaning uh, with COVID. It's doubled again um, with that. And what we have always said is we want to pay how much we can rather than how much we can get away with. So uh, hence, we were paying above the real living wage before. Uh, we also do a profit share, uh, which people appreciate as well. And as it happens, we're about to increase everyone by a pound an hour from the 1st of November as well. So it'll be further ahead as well. Um, and much like Katie, uh, we find um, we have loyal people who work for us. Um, one of my fellow directors has been out and about last week uh, and he was saying, um, Simon, I find it really hard to be that interested in cleaning products. They're so into it. So all of the people who work for us, uh, they want to be cleaners. They are, you know, you ask them, how do you get a stain off of your urinal? They'll give you a 30 minute suggestion on how to do that. So we tend to have people who genuinely want to do the job um, rather than people just passing through trying to earn money now, which is really lovely. And, you know, much like Katie said, low turnover of staff, uh, low, less absenteeism, which enables us to keep our, our costs low. So I think in summary, if you help the people do the work, do the work um, and then recognize that actually let's just share the benefits of that. It then gives you some positives later on. But I think that's a very hard message for um, SME yeah. uh, business owners, particularly to to get their heads around. So, um, yeah, anything you can think of to support that. I'm very conscious that Katie used the word words about herself and um, the founder of Burns, that they believe in a fair pay for a fair day's wage. And that's why we do this. We do it because we think it's the right thing to do. Um, so um, I'm sure there's other people out there, but there's also the people there who would like to do it, but can't feel they can afford it. So either we need to tap into more of that belief or we need to help people solve other problems because uh, we do it anyway, whether the real living wage existed, if that made sense. Um, but we think it's we're very pleased to be accredited in the hope that it inspires others. Uh, but I think there is a key bit of work to do, given that SMEs are such a massive part of the economy to start to encourage, OK, how could you share the benefits of what's coming? Yeah, um, thank, you. thank you, Simon. Thank you, Simon. I think that's that's a really important point and um, something we can maybe pick up in, in the chat later. Um, so. I think we're gonna um, we're gonna go back to Debs in a second to introduce the next section. But just to say, the links to the Living Wage site um, have been put in the chat, and also the links to the Cunnel Cymru site. So if you are interested in finding out more, you can register your interest through the Living Wage Foundation site, or you can contact us at Cunnel Cymru. Thanks very much. Thanks, Sarah, and some really interesting points made there by the panelists as well. So thank you, everybody, for that part. So I'm going to pass over to Nurishan now, who is a, a local community leader and actually a Cardiff University student. So, you know, proud of him in a number of ways to tell us about the, uh, the Cardiff uh, Jobs Compact. Thanks, Deb. Uh, and thanks for uh, inviting me on the call uh, today. So um, as Deb said, uh, I'm from Cardiff and I go to Cardiff Uni uh, doing law and politics. Um, the Community Jobs Compact came about in 2017 uh, when we saw the Cardiff Bay area has been well developed uh, over the last two decades uh, with lots of big name businesses and organizations having a presence. However, we found that many living nearby um, in Butetown, Riverside and Grangetown felt underrepresented in lots of those organizations, including major employers like the National Assembly or what is now called the Welsh Parliament. Uh, ITV, Admiral, those big major businesses. Um, and following a lot of one-to-one -one conversations uh, and a listening campaign uh, in the local community, we heard from many uh, graduates uh, and uh, others who struggled to find jobs, uh, not just after university, uh, after they've left school. And it was clear that unfair employment practices and a lack of uh, employment opportunities existed, particularly in and around those areas in Cardiff. So what we decided to do from that listening is uh, launch uh, the Community Jobs Compact. Uh, the compact asks for businesses to be accredited uh, as a living wage uh, uh, employer, uh, as um, those before me mentioned, uh, what is the importance of that? Um, the other two asks of the compact ask for uh, using name and address blind uh, applications as part of the recruitment process. This is to in ensure that there is no discrimination taking place. We found that uh, lots of people applying to these opportunities and jobs uh, felt that their name or where they came from had something to do with them not getting uh, that opportunity. So we decided to incorporate that into our compact, making sure that people and employers uh, are only looking at abilities and skills uh, of those applying. 
And the other ask that we ask for is employers to do unconscious bias training as part of their recruitment uh, processes. This is, again, to ensure that uh, staff in big organizations and small ones uh, know uh, what their biases are. I know that when recruiting, uh, they can identify any potential uh, bias that they have and that uh, struggle to find in uh, areas around Cardiff. In turn, um, as part of that commitment for them signing up to the uh, com uh, compact, we will provide job opportunities in the local community, do drop-ins and promote that uh, within the area. This is key for us in, in order, because we found from our listening campaign that lots of opportunities are missed by uh, communities around that area. Uh, and we decided that there's not a, a relationship between big employers and local communities where they felt underrepresented. So as part of that commi commitment in order to make sure the compact truly works is that employers adopt these three asks, but in, order, in return, we will provide uh, drop-in and other services and major employers like IKEA, ITV, um, then Welsh Parliament, uh, Victim Support Cymru uh, have signed up uh, to the compact in, in order to promote their opportunities. Um, and I'll pass to one of those employers now, uh, Jess uh, Reese, who is the hate crime manager for Victim Support Cymru. You can provide more insight into what the compact has done uh, for that employer. Thank you, Nira Shan, um, and thank you everyone for having me today. Um, so yes, my name is Jessica Reese, and I manage the National Hate Crime Report and Support Centre, which is run by the charity Victim Support and is funded by Welsh Government. We are a small team consisting of 13 staff members, where we provide support to victims of hate crime across Wales, as well as delivering training, raising awareness, and we're a third party reporting centre. I wanted to sign up to the Community Jobs Compact as I wanted to ensure our staff are being paid at least a real living wage for their commitment to their roles and to reflect the importance of the work that we do. I also wanted our team to reflect the diversity of the service users that we support. So the people that access our service, they've usually been targeted for their race, religion, sexual orientation, gender identity or disability. So it was important that our team was reflective of this. Since signing up, I have only had to make small changes to my recruitment processes. We've already seen a massive reward in these small changes. We already had incorporated two of the asks that Nirishan referred to um, in terms of paying the real living wage and doing unconscious bias training. So after signing the compact, I raised victim support as a national charity being accredited as a living wage employer. And since then, we're now in the process of doing that. I adjusted our job descriptions to remove any overcomplicated language and I added lived experience of hate crime and the ability to speak additional languages other than Welsh as desirable criteria. We also gave guaranteed interviews to those living locally in community first areas who met the criteria. We also hosted a jobs drop-in in Butte Town. This was all pre-COVID, um, but have since delivered these virtual drop-ins uh, over Zoom. This essentially gives potential candidates the opportunity to ask me any questions about the role and for me to run through the job description in more detail. Since signing up, we've seen a lot more diverse candidates apply and ultimately this is reflected in our team with 25% of our team identifying as BAME up from 12% before signing the compact. And we only hope that that increases. We've also increased our representation from other protected characteristics across the team, such as sexual orientation, religion and disability. Although COVID has changed the way we work in relation to supporting people remotely and all of our staff are now working from home, it luckily hasn't impacted the scheme as I've still been able to do the virtual jobs drop-ins with citizens and they've been a massive help in assisting with this and sharing our job vacancies to networks and people that I would have never had access to before. We ensured we continued our commitment to the compact and have continued to engage with citizens to ensure these opportunities and new job vacancies are still being shared to local communities. Thank you. Uh, thanks for that, Jess. Um, and, and victim support and other employees have made a massive difference, especially uh, to those local communities in, in ensuring not only opportunities are fed into them, but people feeling represented and getting jobs and apprenticeships uh, due to the uh, compact. Um, and this, this uh, is really important to us because we found that um, a lot of graduates, especially uh, graduating from university uh, after leaving, struggle to find employment 
and we realized this is a major problem for where we live and where we uh, reside, especially considering um, we wanted more role models uh, and others uh, in the community saying, if you do go to university, there are opportunities for you. But what we found is that when people don't get these opportunities, uh, lots of young younger people, especially, uh, doubted doubted themselves, but also uh, said, "What is the point in going to university?" And we felt that compared to the southern arc of the city, where uh, the is uh, quite poor, compared to the more prosperous part of uh, the north of the city of Cardiff, we realised that there's a massive uh, wealth inequality between the two areas and um, one of the things we definitely wanted to incorporate into the compact was a real living wage which seeks to address poverty wages and when we did our listening campaign in 2017 we found lots of families who work two three jobs just to make ends meet and not just have disposable income but for essential things that they had to work uh, two three jobs so we realized this is not only an important campaign uh, to address uh, uh, unfair employment practices and build that relationship between employers and communities, but to address poverty wages as well. We realise big employers and small ones need to step up to ensure that their staff are not left in poverty even when they're in work. So this was a really impactful and really uh, a major thing for us, especially considering that uh, we wanted graduates to make sure that they get the opportunities that they deserve and local community members felt represented and also addressed their uh, lack of uh, high wages that they got and to make sure that inequalities in our city is addressed, especially compared to the north of the city. And uh, if you did want to sign up to the compact, uh, I think Deb just put the link in uh, uh, in the chat where you can read about what the compact asks for and get in contact uh, with Citizens Wales who can have that discussion with you. Well, what we don't uh, expect is uh, when you sign up to the compact to straight away do the three asks, but you work with us in order to uh, incorporate these, uh, those into your employment practices. Uh, we work with uh, major employers to make sure that uh, they feel comfortable enough uh, in order to do, do unconscious bias training. We can refer to specialists who de deliver that, uh, refer to other employees who do name and address blind applications, and again, refer to Canal Cymru who can help you in that accreditation of the living wage process. Um, but if you did want to get in touch, please do uh, drop us a line uh, and we'll definitely get back to you and uh, talk about and discuss how we can move forward with that. Uh, I'll pass back to uh, Deps to, for the next part. Thanks, Nourishan. Thank um, and I have done some work with our students down um, in Butte Town on the community um, jobs compact and the difference that it is making in those local communities in the Southern Arc is very clear and it's a fantastic scheme that has been organically grown by the local community. So if you think you can get involved in that and, and work with um, communities that have got huge amounts of talent, please do contact um, citizens. So I'm going to pass over to Leanne now, who's going to talk about the final um a commitment that we have uh, as part of today's session and that's payroll lending so over to you Leanne. Thanks Debs, good morning everybody. Um, Carbon Vale Credit Union is a financial services cooperative offering savings and loans products to local people. We're now in our sixth year and we're for our own staff. Um, we work with nearly 50 employers across all sectors locally to, um, to offer their staff the option of saving regularly or repaying affordable credit directly from their salary into an account with us. Um, we recognise that it's now more important than ever that we make it as easy as possible for local employees to build their financial resilience in, in these uncertain times, building a regular savings culture and critically ensuring a source of, of ethical credit where that's needed. Research has shown that one in five households in Wales have no savings to fall back on in the event of a crisis and Cardiff specifically has been cited as a payday lending hotspot in the UK. So stats from the Financial Conduct Authority released last year showed that in just one year, over 11,000 high interest payday loans were taken out locally um, with a combined 17 and a half million pounds, just, just, just in the, the local Cardiff area. We believe that our payroll partnerships can proactively address these issues and we're ready to play our role in terms of building back better um, and, and building financial well-being locally uh, for local staff. Um, as an example of this, our combined savings of, of members um, currently is just over seven million and this has increased by over a million since lockdown first started so we're confident that our payroll partnerships are already building resilience for our members in terms of, of building savings for the future 
There's no charge to employers who partner with us. Um, and we surveyed our employer partners um, to ask them, did they agree that it was easy to, the scheme was easy to administer and, and would they recommend it? And all said that it was easy and, and they would recommend it to, to other employers. And we, we want as many local employers to, to partner with us as possible. Um, our ma main employers, we, we've got over, um, over 40, it's approaching 50. Um, the, the largest ones are Cardiff Council, Vail Council, Welsh Government, Admiral, legal in general, Welsh Water, the, the local NHS boards, um, also local support providers and housing associations, so all shapes and sizes and, and different sectors. And I'm very pleased to be joined by Sarah Edwards today from Link Housing Cymru, who've got a really successful payroll partnership uh, with us, thanks, to, thanks to, to Sarah and the work she's done. So I'm going to pass over to Sarah to give their perspective of the scheme for, from um, an employer's point of view. Oh, good morning, everyone. Um, yeah, thanks for the invitation to come um, to come along to the breakfast uh, meeting this morning, because we are keen to talk about the benefits that we found for both ourselves as a company and our employees um, as being part of um, the payroll partnership with Credit Union. We um, we kind of come across the need for this um, through our well-being strategy in as much as we did roadshows and asked our employees what it is we could do that we felt would make their well-being better. Um, and lots of the feedback was was around finances and finances affecting lots of different areas of their life. And some of the requests we received were oh, could I just save through my pay? Because once I've had it, it's gone, you know? So we, um, we with the help of Credit Union, we did roadshows and we signed people up. We let them know what the benefits were of belonging to the scheme. And it virtually sold itself. Um, and the outcome is that we have almost 50 accounts um, set up now with um, regular monthly contributions into it. Um, so the question was, why does it work so well for us at Lincoln for our team? It's because of the benefits that come with it. It's the, the benefit of not having to commit too much money every month. It, um, it also are the added benefits of life insurance, which some people didn't realise came with their accounts. But more importantly, it came with the ethical lending ethos that came from the credit union. As Leanne mentioned earlier, during discussions that I'd had with my team, payday loans and high interest lending um, came up quite often in our conversations and they added more pressures. So they now have a vehicle in which to access loans ethically, affordable payback, but also the ability to save while repaying. So all of these benefits just felt like the credit union was a good place for us to start um, looking after our employees' well-being. And we did think about how we could continue this work during the COVID um, lockdown situations because we're not having as much contact. And, and yes, it is having a slight impact, but it is things that are fixable. Um, the impact is that previously to have people join the scheme, we would incorporate it into our inductions and have a, a Q&A session there, but we're not having that face-to-face -face, uh, contact at the minute. So that is the only barrier that we're facing, but it isn't one that isn't fixable and it's one that we're working on at the moment. So yeah, thank you very much for um, taking the time to listen to our experience of the credit union with Link. Thank you. Thanks very much, Sarah. Um, and hopefully now we're going to go to a video of one of your um, employees, Amy, that you prepared earlier, who's going yes. to talk about um, their experience um, from a, a, a member's point of view. Thank so you. hopefully we'll, we'll have the video. Now. Thank you, Sarah. Hang on one second. There we are. Can everyone see that? <laughs> yeah. Amy Page and I'm the Health and Safety Coordinator here at Link Henry. Um, I have a credit a union savings account that comes directly out of my um, monthly pay. Um, I think I only save about £25 a month, but it's great because you completely forget about it. Um, you don't know it's there, especially if it was already in your savings account. I know I would have been spending it by now. I think I've had the account for six months um, and I'm just 
leave it there for a rainy day because I'm younger I don't I don't really want to start paying into a pension just yet so for me it's a great alternative um and yeah it's just a good all-rounder especially if you want to save for Christmas or anything like that I would definitely recommend it action yeah Thank you very great. Thank you very much for, for that and for, for Sarah for organising that. Um, all that's left for, for me to say is that we really want to hear from as many local employers as possible. Um, Deb has, has circulated our, our contact details. Um, if you email us at info at cardiffcu.com, we'd be very happy to send you a, a pack with more details um, or very happy to have a conversation with you if you want to find out more. Thanks very much. So thank you, uh, Leanne. Thank you to everyone who's taken part this morning in what has been a whistle-stop tour of ways organisations can start to think about building back better. It's worth saying that none of these schemes you need to sign up to overnight. Every single one of these schemes, the, the people who've spoken will, will work with you as Nirashan to, to think about the steps you can take to move towards uh, accreditation. They all have options um, within them to help you establish milestones. As the mornings progress, we've been posting in the chat box the contact details of those leading on the project so you can start those conversations. But again, there's lots of other options available out there that we haven't had a chance to cover. And perhaps some people might want to mention um, in the Q&A part. Um, so at this point, I'm going to stop from our side and throw to the floor and ask if anybody's got any questions or comments they want to direct to the panel more generally. Um, and while people take the a second to post those there was already one question in the question answer box um which was asking about the quantification of um savings so this was richie who said um katie and simon so both members of the living wage uh, panel mentioned reductions in management time less hr less absenteeism etc is there any research which quantifies these savings that are possible um, and actually have Katie and, and Simon quantified that, this. So I've um, posted links to a couple of pieces of research that I'm aware of in the in the chat function. One is a piece of research that I'm going to have to declare interest. I was part of uh, looking at living wage experience that says 93 percent of employers can identify clear benefits within their organisations and actually breaks down the levels of those benefits. So we don't put numbers on those, but we we know the numbers of employers who are citing that they are experiencing positive benefits and then also linked to um, a piece of research done by another academic called Jane Wills where she does start to, to try and quantify some of the impact but I guess I'll throw over to Simon and Katie to say have you looked at the numbers on this and and without giving us the details of your finances can you can you put any numbers on some of this go on Simon you've got your mic off so I'm guessing yeah, um, I, I was going to say um we've gone through quite a period of growth. So I've turned off a couple of our measures. Um, so my judge of this is how stressed are the people in the office? Uh, and they're considerably less stressed um, yeah. in the last sort of 18 months than they were in the previous year, I would say, because we just, they're not dealing with as many absences. But I'm so sorry, I don't have um, data on that. It is something I could per perhaps bring in the future, um, but I'm hoping Katie, obviously with her role in HR, might have some uh, some stuff that will be more useful. So sorry about that. That's a, that's a really interesting point, Simon. I think we are um, we are definitely aligned in terms of you know everybody knows that the culture of an organisation is is absolutely set by the owner. Um, so I use um, apps such as Breathe HR. That's an excellent app if you want some really posh graphs actually quantify um, you know things like retention absenteeism and you know also things like employee um, engagement surveys such as you know survey monkey that's another really great app but all I, all I will say my only comment on that is you know let the focus of the living wage really um, is holistic you know John Burns or owner is just like you Simon far more interested in the actual emotional health of our staff. Um, rather than sort of being obsessed by numbers and I think that's again why we are so strong and you know we have a really sustainable durable business model so graphs and you know um, you know quantifiable information is is absolutely key however I really wouldn't make that the the be all end all if everybody's having a you know a laugh in the office and really working hard and fully engaged um, that is that you know that is the for, for us the be all end all of uh, you know, of a really great company to work for. So I hope that answers the question. 
It really does. Thanks, Katie. And I think with all these schemes, um, you know, the, the intangible benefits are by far the important thing that, that I hear when employers talk about their experiences. Um, but that's not to say that there aren't real fi um, financial and tangible benefits alongside that. So I'll throw to Sarah Lethbridge, who has indicated she wants to ask a question. I was just wondering whether, you know, just in your sort of experience, is there a relationship between companies that pursue these sort of schemes and generally how much innovation those companies like to seek out? Do you think that there's a, a kind of, you know, people that are more on board to try these new things actually are quite innovative in the services that they provide? So I don't know, Sarah Hopkins, you're nodding. Have you got a response to that one? <laughs> so I drop you in that. No, I was just not. It's a really interesting point. <laughs> um, I, 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 I don't know is my is my answer. I mean, I would think so. And, you know, I work, used to work in the supply chain. And when we were working with factories, generally, you'd see that if they were engaged in sustainability across, it could be environmental. So, you know, chemicals um, you know, getting hazardous chemicals out of the supply chain or it would have been fair wages. They also used to also invest more in um you know their workplaces and in the innovation so i, I would say from a purely um yeah my experience yes but i don't have any data on it i'm sorry <laughs> no and i would agree certainly looking at some of the, the the data that we've got in terms of living wages the employers that tend to be doing this tend to be doing a range of other things as well and they tend to be the ones that are recruiting well with the the kind of young graduates who come in with very innovative skills so yeah I think there is a particular type of um, employer that is very keen on this, but that's not to say that it isn't something that could be of interest to all employers. Mm. So I'm going to throw there's a really interesting question here on the on the chat function. Mary, do you want to ask this one direct, directly? Mary, Arthur. Yes, I'm happy to. Um, it was just that there's a lot of publicity um, coming from Scotland on different schemes that the government is supporting. And I was just wondering, I haven't seen much on the whole ethical working, fair work agenda since there was a lot of media around the um, fair work report um, that I know Cardiff University was involved in and it's been quite quiet for a while. So I was just wondering, are there things going on behind the scenes or are things on hold? Obviously, we're coming up to an election, but it'd be just good to know what support there is from the government because there's a lot of this reliant on individual employers yeah is that to me uh yeah you can you can do that one sarah i was just um so from from welsh government as far as i'm aware at the moment there's no support in terms of financial support but for card from cardiff council if you're a cardiff based sme there is still they have extended the living wage accreditation support scheme so this is for um organizations with employees uh, of less fewer than 250 and i've posted the link to more information about that in the the chat function as well but you have to be um based in cardiff but so hi simon Sorry, I didn't want to interrupt Sarah, just... Uh, <laughs> I thought you... Um, so this this really, I mean, Cardiff Council is currently the only local authority that is accredited in Wales, but we are seeing a growing um, interest from other local authorities. So we do expect other local authorities to start offering um, accreditation support in the form of these kind of subsidies at the moment. Um, hopefully that will come in the next, uh, over the next year. Um. Yeah, great. So the, the next question I'm going to throw to is by an anonymous attendee. So I'll ask this one and actually I'll expand it slightly. I wonder if um, very, very quickly in no more than a kind of a minute, whether the, the different panellists could uh, expand on the process of accreditation and the costs involved. So if we could perhaps start with, um, we'll start backwards. Leanne, how, how easy is it to accredit or, or sign up to the payroll lending and are there any costs involved? Uh, so there's no, there's no cost at all to to employers. Um, there's no membership fee that that we um, apply to um, employees joining. We do ask a minimum of five pound to activate the the membership account. There's no minimum amount people can save either. It, it's up to them. Perfect. Um, Nirishan, uh, how is it easy is it to sign up to the Community Jobs Compact, and are there any costs involved? I uh, know there, there's no costs costs involved. Um, it's just an initial uh, meeting with some of the leaders in terms of signing the compact and working with us to incorporate those three asks. Brilliant. 
And Sarah, how easy is it to accredit and are there any costs involved? <laughs> um, it can be very simple to accredit or it can be a bit more complicated if you have lots of contractors um, and lots of different uh, yeah, people coming on onto your premises. Um, but if you register your interest at the link, then um, we will send you then an application form and a license agreement, which you need to complete. Um, that comes back to us and the, the accreditation, once that's approved, can take a, a week and a half. So it can be quite quick, but it really depends on the size of the organization organization and the complexity um, but we're here to, to support you through that um, costs involved there is an annual accreditation fee it depends on the size of your organization um, for large organizations over 500 people it's uh, three thousand pounds it's a lot less um, for small businesses so I think it starts at 120 pounds a year and um, then 240 and 360 uh, the links to the costs are also on the Cardiff Council website Thank you. Um, so there's a question here um, from Richard. I don't know, Richard, do, do you want to answer that, ask that one live? Yeah, can you hear me okay? Can, yes. Great. So just quickly, I think, um, yeah, the, the conversation this morning has been great. And just to, to reflect a kind of uh, concern that I wonder if kind of most people here are already in thinking in this way. And so I wonder how this sort of message gets more broadly broadcast um, in the future. So no, I'm not expecting an answer to that one. <laughs> but just to, I, think, I think it's a really interesting question, this idea that um, those with the kind of healthy business practices are, are going to be better set to, to kind of move through the crisis. Mm -hmm. um, and I don't know if any of the panellists have got a view on this, but certainly from our perspective as researchers at Cardiff Business School, this is something that we're working with the Living Wage Foundation and citizens with at the minute to look at these practices. Um, obviously, there's going to be a bit of a time lag. Um, but anecdotally, what we are hearing is that those with the more ethical business practices are the ones that are faring that bit better um, and, and have a potential for longer term um, success, I guess, for want of a better word. I don't know if anybody's got anything more that they want to say that nobody's. Nobody's. The question is just whether whether having healthier businesses means you're more likely to come through this crisis well, and therefore that becomes an imperative for more people to get ready for what will be more uncertainty, more crises coming. Yeah, I, I think, yeah. Go on, Simon, you've got your hand up. Yeah, so I think it's a really important point, Richard. Uh, we've certainly found that that uh, it's become more important to our customers, the what the treatment of staff and the ethical approach. Uh, I think uh, the, the difficulties we're in has brought that to the fore for everyone. Um, I, I think in terms of encouraging others, I agree with you, Richard. I think people naturally gravitate to that who have that sort of approach anyway to this. Um, and, and my thoughts on this, I'm quite involved in the foundational economy movement. My thoughts on this, if we have strong direction from the government to buy locally from organizations that employ locally uh, and retain the profits locally, um, that will make a massive difference to cash flow uh, and therefore make it easier for businesses to move towards that. That doesn't necessarily impact on us because it's hard to buy cleaning, not locally, if that makes sense. But there's lots and lots and lots of organizations out there um, who would um, really benefit from that sort of direction. Um, so I think that, that would enable people to think about this, uh, where at the moment they're just looking at a brick wall of um, cost rising and, uh, and um, revenue dropping. So a really important point, Richard. Thank you. Yeah. Um, what, one last very quick question, and um, then we'll draw a close to the, the proceedings, I guess, um, is how would accreditation, and I'm guessing we're talking about living wage here again, impact on organisational pay structures? Um, so I don't know, Katie, if you want to say anything or Simon, if you want to say anything about how it's impacted your pay structures. And then Sarah, if you want to just um, come at it from maybe a, a more factual approach. Katie? I think for us, I mean, the pay structure, um, like I um, you know, mentioned during my sort of quick chat, we've always had an extremely healthy pay structure. We've, you know, we've always paid, um, you know, well over and above the, um, you know, the government uh, minimum wage. So, I mean, for us, accreditation was um, extremely easy, a very, um, you know, smooth process. It just kind of, you know, validated, you know, what we were already doing. Um, you know, I can understand that some businesses, um, you know, would really be looking at their pay structure and wondering, you know, can they implement this? You know, what are the risks involved? Um, but we've just found that the benefits are, um, you know, well worth it. Um, you know, for example, um, I'll just refer to the, you know, the pandemic. I mean, we paid all our all the staff who were on furlough. We actually paid them in full, um, and it just 
we'd already seen them coming back from furlough um, fully, fully engaged, full of brimming, full of ideas. Um, so I, I think that, you know, looking at the pay structure, I can, you know, understand and sympathise with some employers, especially, you know, the hospitality industry, for example. Um, but it's it's all about it's all about long term thinking. And I think the businesses who just engage in short term thinking, um, you know, they, they re- you do really have to think about, you know, the, the long game here. And I think next year when we see our profits still healthy, we, we know that looking at the, you know, maintaining our pay structure as it stands, um, it, it is well worth it. Sarah Hopkins, did you want to add anything to that from a, no? Simon. 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 Yeah, yeah, very briefly, we work in a very unusual way that everyone gets paid the same. So even the MD. So um, and then we use profit distribution in a different way. Uh, and I, I, if you want to do that, that's you know brilliant. But it, it comes with a lot of challenges. You can imagine why am I paid the same as so and so? I'm doing this. So rather than cave into that, we just end up having a lot of difficult conversations around it. But in a way, it makes it very simple. But again, we we're able to do that in the nature of our business. Um, it's not always the same for others, um, but we do find that people being on uh, considerably l- more than perhaps they're getting a different role uh, or different organisation doing the same role um, helps take pay off the table uh, as an issue, if that makes sense. So, yeah, okay. thank you for the question. Thank you. And a great, great kind of way to bring this to uh, a conclusion, I guess, and hand back to Sarah, who has been a generous host for us this morning. Thank you, Sarah. Well, thanks so much, everyone. Really fantastic to hear tangible steps that you can take to build back better. And um, there's loads of links. They'll be coming around in the email to everybody um, who registered for this session. So thank you. And also my question about this link between, um, you know, whether you're more more, um, inclined to be innovative if you adopt these sort of things has been answered by Professor Alan Felstead. So um, yeah, please do follow that link there. And Alan's actually going to be talking in our last um, breakfast briefing of the year as well. So um, some fantastic research that Alan leads on for Cardiff University. So please do join us for that one. So thanks ever so much, everybody. Um, See you at another breakfast briefing soon. Um, Spread the word. Um, together, I think we can we can help to to help the um, business community out of this crisis because it's such difficult times. I know I'm struggling at the moment working from home. Um, so yeah, we we just all need to stick together really, and hopefully there'll be an end to it all one day. So thanks ever so much, everyone. Goodbye.